Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Vicky Brewster. I'm a PhD candidate in the English department at Swansea University. My research focus is hauntings in 21st century fiction. Um, I am also a full-time editor uh, and I run a gothic writing retreat uh, called The Writing Haunt. So our talk today is going to be about gothic social media and the found phone trope. This is falling out of uh, my first PhD chapter, uh, my first thesis chapter, which is about the novels of Jason Arnup, who we are going to be discussing a little bit later, um, and focuses a lot on go gothic social media and uh, ghosts, literal ghosts in literal machines. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of a side tangent from that, uh, but I hope you enjoy. There is a strong tradition of the found text in Gothic fiction, all the way from its inception with Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto, a novel which within its own fiction claimed to be an authentic manuscript from the 12th century. This established the found document as a staple of Gothic fiction, repeated again and again through Victorian Gothic and lasting within the genre through to Mark Z. Danielewski's House of Leaves in the year 2000 and beyond. It's a trope that was enthusiastically reimagined and taken up by late 20th century films as found footage, starting with the, with the Blair Witch Project in 1999, the film which coined the term with its title card claiming the film as footage was found. It continued into the 21st century with the Paranormal Activity franchise, which lasted from 2007 to 2015, and Cloverfield in 2008. These films rely purely on footage apparently taken as home movies or on personal recording devices by the characters to tell the whole of their narrative, framed as real recorded footage. This trope, however, has once again transformed in the 21st century into what might be termed the found phone trope. Stories using this trope revolve around the discovery of a phone or other smart device apparently abandoned. The viewer, player or protagonist must go through the phone's contents in order to progress the story by discovering the phone's and its owner's secrets. This switch between found tropes from decade to decade in the late 20th and early 21st century demonstrates the way in which, as Adam Charles Hart describes it, quote, our ghosts take on the form and qualities of our media, end quote. A society becomes more dependent on the smartphone, so this becomes the perfect talisman for gothic haunting. However, unlike previous found subgenres, the found phone is not limited to a single format of entertainment media. The flexibility of the subgenre has made it an ideal interactable device suitable for many forms of entertainment media. Examples of it can be found in novels like Ghoster by Jason Arnup, which we'll be looking at in more depth later. Uh, video games like Simulacra and Simulacra 2, A Normal Lost Phone and Another, uh, Another Lost Phone and Unread. And movies like Unfriended and Searching. Uh, and host, I should mention, is also another popular example that I don't have a picture of. <laughs> uh, although these media all involve looking at the private contents of a phone, such as messages and call logs or photos, they all also often involve hacking the phone owner's social media. This hacking is also a popular mechanic in entertainment media utilized in augmented reality or AR games, like Plymouth Point, the Mermaid's Tongue and Jury Game, and documentaries like American Murder, The Family Next Door. The user interface of most phones assumes that a single security barrier, such as the pin code or fingerprint to unlock a phone or password to access a laptop or tablet, is sufficient to protect other normally password protected apps and interfaces. As such, an unlocked phone is also a gateway to social media sites, emails, and even financial records. Thus, the unlocked smart device allows the user access to a plethora of apparently private information. This access allows the user viewer to experience the real person who owns the phone, as exposed by the revelations gained from this private information. In this paper, we will first examine in more detail the trope shift between found document, found footage and found phone, as it occurred over the period from the late 90s to the present day. The found phone trope will then be investigated as its own phenomena, discuss, uh, focusing on the use of social media and the pervasive and adaptive ways in which social media can be utilized to provide entertainment. 
but also how it is used to invoke a sense of horror or unease in the user viewer. To do this, we will look at some of the broader uses of found phone in various entertainment media. Social media and portable devices, uh, sorry, portable smart devices will be considered in terms of their position in the Gothic universe and the ways in which they reuse and adapt existing Gothic tropes. We will then focus on an individual Gothic text using close textual analysis of Jason Arnup's Ghoster to look more closely at the Gothic traditions utilized in the novel and the ways in which these are applied to a smartphone and ideas of the digital self. This paper will demonstrate finally that the smart device acts as a talisman or even avatar in the 21st century, blurring the boundary as to where the individual self really is. As such, social media and smart devices present an opportunity for the self to be corrupted in a way that is both horrific and gothic by the fictional supernatural presence, but equally by our peers in the shape of potential hackers. A notable recent example of found, for, uh, found document is Danielewski's House of Leaves. House of Leaves is a work of fiction presented as a manuscript found by one of the book's characters, Johnny Truant, which comprises essays written by an academic called Zampano on a fictional documentary, another found document, that explores a house with apparently impossible hidden dimensions. It is larger on the inside than it is on the outside. Truant has subsequently made annotations to the text telling his own story and fictionally passed the whole to an editor. This third character or source has subsequently made their own annotations and formatted and proofed the document for publication. This setup of the narrators of the text being both reader and author in that they experience the documentary that is the subject of the essays or annotate the essays themselves, creates what Hansen describes as, quote, a merging of author and reader function, end quote, which we will later see and explore in more detail with the found phone. The book as an object appears not as a normal work of fiction with distinctly formatted margins denoting a single continuous piece of work but as though the original document has been photocopied or cut up with text written at different angles and orientations and squared off boxes, uh, sorry, squared off in boxes to suggest holes in the original. Um, so on the presentation at the moment, you can see on the left-hand picture, one of these boxes where the text inside the box is a copy of what you can see further on in the book. So it acts like it's a hole in the text. Um, the middle picture, is kind of formatted more like poetry, um, but you can see on the left-hand leaf um, a slightly odd angle on it, so it looks like it's been photocopied in. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, pieces have actually been crossed out and annotated over the top. The formatting is a key part of this text and seems to have been designed to immerse the reader as much as possible in the reality of the text. As with found document novels throughout Gothic's history, the author puts a strong emphasis on the veracity of the document. These various layers of readers and annotated voices, as well as the formatting, not as a normal novel, but as a manuscript, are designed to make the reader believe it is a true found document. However, the various annotations also go to some effort to prove that parts of the book cannot be true within their own fictional world. As Truant writes in his foreword, quote, Zampano's entire project is about a film which doesn't even exist, end quote. Even if it did, Zampano himself is blind and would be unable to write the vivid and detailed descriptions of the visuals of the documentary, which he apparently does. In this respect, we go back to Hansen, who says that, quote, the novel insistently stages the futility of any effort to anchor the events it recounts in a stable recorded form, end quote, while also making effort efforts to make the physical object of the book itself as realistic as possible. The balancing act that takes place is perhaps intrinsic to the Gothic genre itself. As McRoberts writes, quote, Gothic narratives are predicated on the complex interaction of reality and fiction, end quote. This is a contradiction that is quite postmodern, being somehow both self-referential and self-denying questioning the nature of House of Leaves' reality, while also going to great pains to prove it as a reality. This perhaps also reflects the tension rising at the turn of the 21st century about the nature of reality. The World Wide Web allowed people for the first time to pretend to be whoever they wanted, 
and the increasing availability of software like Photoshop meant that apparently real documents or records could be easily and cheaply manipulated to a high quality. However, House of Leaves is as a whole still just a document. The book is an analog production, and while it is available for Kindle and e-reader, the text is diminished in these formats precisely because the formatting and the way the book looks on the page is so integral to the mood the author is aiming to deliver. Its digital formatting is unable to produce this. Reproduce this, sorry. Uh, the fan trope moves towards the digital age in 1999 with the first found footage film, The Blair Witch Project and continues with Paranormal Activity and Cloverfield. Although some of these films are recorded apparently on analog devices, they still allowed the found document genre to become portable and personalized. Rather than reading what a real person has written, they allow that person to directly address the audience with their own voice and face, giving apparently genuine reactions in real time. The found footage genre also allowed filmmakers to utilize layers of narrative, like the multiple annotated voices in House of Leaves. Okay, I've got a clip here from Cloverfield um, that is going to demonstrate what I mean by providing an extra layer of reality. Uh, I will warn that there is gunshot and flashing and a lot of shaky cam in this clip. So if you're particularly sensitive to that, then you might want to look away. It's one continuous film, at least at this point. Um, they're utilizing features of the camera, like the zoom function to communicate with each other. And also the scripting or the lack of scripting feels very natural. So they're having a regular conversation back and forth before the monster rears up and everything comes out. Uh, there's also obviously a lack of a musical track on the background. So in that respect, everything is presented as very real. Uh, the stories in these films aren't just about a single or multiple characters filming, but also use the mode itself to provide layers of context and like House of Leaves to play with the idea of reality and unreality. In Cloverfield, the conceit is that the viewer is watching the full footage of a single SD card unedited. The camera footage regularly breaks or cuts to what was previously recorded on the same SD card, showing footage apparently unrelated to the main story that provides deeper context on characters and relationships away from the violence and terror of the main story. Um, so the way that that will happen is that you'll see pretty much what you've seen and then there'll be a kind of glitch screen and uh, it cuts to a, a couple having a really nice day on Coney Island, just to kind of give that added layer of it's recorded over something else. So there are again, layers of meaning and layers of narrative. Similarly, paranormal, act similarly, paranormal activity features footage of the protagonist playing through the previously recorded footage and reacting to it, providing postmodern layers of narrative, metafiction and metatextuality. Oh, hang on. As well as utilizing the way found footage can create a closer link between the viewer and characters, it also plays on some of the anxieties of its time. The turn of the 21st century saw a vast increase in the broadcast and access of news media. This was a growing concern in the 90s, with particular highlights being the death of Princess Diana as she was chased by a mob of media photographers and the subsequent revelations about the level of surveillance she suffered in the years prior to her death in 1997. Similarly, the O.J. Simpson alleged murders, arrests and trial were fully televised and showcased not only, uh, sorry, televised and showcased, not only demonstrating new access to the public via the media, but the ways in which public opinion falling out of this access could affect the events themselves. The invasive techniques of the media apparently escalated through the 2000s with the news of the world phone hacking scandal. All of this culminated in the UK in the Leveson inquiry in 2011 to 2012, an inquiry into the culture practices and ethics of the press. These events have also been receiving new media attention in the last few years, uh, such as the You're Wrong About podcast, which has done lengthy rehashings of both OJ's trial and Princess Diana's life and death, and the Ryan Murphy biopic, The People vs. OJ Simpson. 
To me, this suggests an interest occurring now on how these media circuses came to be and an attempt to plot the course from the media explosion and concerns about lack of privacy in this very specific time period to the Instagram culture we now live in. These anxieties are reflected most clearly in the latest of these films, Cloverfield, in which as a stream of monsters invade New York, the group who filmed the invasion on a private camcorder find themselves hiding between cars alongside news crews. At one point, HUD, who is pictured here, the camera operator for the majority of the film, stands apparently hypnotized by televisions in an electronics store, showing footage of the very events taking place outside. And as he's filming him, well, he's not filming himself, but as he's filming the news footage that he can see through the window, in the window, you can kind of see the exact same thing happening behind him. So again, it's that layers of narrative of filming, watching, filming watching filming, coming out like Russian dolls. <laughs> uh, when Hud is asked by his friend Ben why he's still filming the apparent alien invasion, Hud responds, and unfortunately I couldn't find a tidy clip of this, uh, so you'll have to bear with my acting. Uh, Hud says, people are gonna want to know how it all went down. Ben says, well, you can just tell them how it all went down, Hud. And Hud says, no, that wouldn't work. People need to see this, you know. It's going to be important. People are going to watch this. And again, we've got that emphasis on watching. Hud is expressing here the mood of the 2000s, the desire to consume news footage that is constant and invasive and personal to people to whom the viewer can relate, as well as the danger of becoming apparently hypnotized by this footage and the lengths the media and increasingly individuals will go to in order to get this footage. However, Hud is also relating how, increasingly, news media is being presented. The title card of a found footage film is used as a framing device to demonstrate to the audience that these films take place in their own real world. Cloverfield, pictured on the left here, gives an evidence reference code that states the footage has come from an SD card. Paranormal activity, which is not uh, pictured, thanks the families of the fictional protagonists for allowing the use of the film. And the Blair Witch Project on the right states that after the disappearance of three students, quote, their footage was found, end quote. McRoberts describes the purpose of the initial framing card, quote, this short framing message condenses the essential ingredients of the found footage phenomenon, amateur filmmakers, a mysterious disappearance, and the claim that the following material is the unmediated footage of true events, end quote. But I would argue that more than this, it is the increasing prominence of the footage and journalism of civilian individuals in the mainstream media that make found footage films feel realistic. When the world watched the first plane fly into the World Trade Center, it was on footage taken from a civilian's phone. McRoberts describes this period as, quote, a moment of transition in which the institutional media apparatus failed and inadvertent eyewitnesses became the conduit for the world's spectatorship, end quote. Increasingly, this became the, week, the way people receive media, not just through the television, but also through social media. In the 2000s, there was largely still an assumption that what the viewer saw in the media was essentially true and reliable in a way that, as we all know, will become problematized in the decades that follow. Catherine Spooner, reflecting on the found footage film subgenre, notes that, quote, the found manuscript theme has inevitably been transformed by the growth of information technologies. The labyrinthine intricacies of the World Wide Web creates the potential for all kinds of felicitous discoveries, end quote. This is a quote that really leads on to the next development in the found subgenre, the found phone. While found footage allows filmmakers to emphasize a personal connection with the lead characters of their films, the texts produced were largely, largely still analog, single media and non-intertextual. With a found phone, a creator is really able to utilize these labyrinthine intricacies, not just of the World Wide Web, but of the social networks that come as part and parcel of a smartphone's functionality. The found phone trope most commonly utilizes the finding of a phone or other smart device that belongs apparently to a stranger about whom the main characters or in some media, the player themselves must unravel a mystery using the various apps and social networking information available to them. 
The majority of these media present lifelike screen reproductions when presenting this area of the story. The unfriended films frame or film the entire story through a tablet or laptop screen. And again, I've got a little clip here. Okay, so again, because it's a trailer, certain things have been added or emphasized that aren't in the original film, such as zooming in on the screen and the background music. Those don't exist in the actual film. All you see is what is up on the screen now is basically a laptop screen. Um, there's no zooming, there's no background. And in particular, I think the use of sound is really interesting because as you can hear when people are talking, it's very echoey in a way that we all recognize. They haven't done anything particularly to the dialogue to help make it uh, polished in the way you would expect from a film. And they're also using uh, programs and program sounds that we're all used to, to again, bring in these additional layers of realism. Uh, the viewer experiences the protagonists only as they appear in Skype or FaceTime calls. As you can see from this clip, although the trailer zooms sometimes for dramatic effect, the film goes to some lengths to heighten the realism, particularly using the sound quality, sounds of typing, recognizable programs and apps, and like in Cloverfield, relatively unknown actors. By only presenting what the fictional laptop or tablet user experiences, the viewer is positioned squarely behind the eyes of the protagonist. In his book, Facebook Society, Roberto Simonowski describes the ways in which society and communities have moved online through social media. He writes that, quote, the more weight Facebook assumes as a symptom and motor of cultural development, the more appropriate it seems to speak of a Facebook society, a society whose forms of communication and cultural techniques are significantly determined by the practice of self-representation and the world perception on Facebook, end quote. Um, and as a brief aside, if anyone is interested in social media, how it's come about, what the intentions are of the people who create social media and the tension between that intention and what the users of social media actually want it for, uh, Simonowski's book is amazing, and I, I heartily recommend it. Uh, while Simonowski is here talking specifically about Facebook, his observation can easily be extended to multiple forms of social media. Simonowski is describing the way in which social networking has become an intrinsic and almost unavoidable aspect of 21st century life. Society has moved online and is no longer restricted to physical geographic boundaries. He describes the ways in which social media allow people to self-curate the person they want others to see in the digital world. However, social media also facilitates sharing or concealment or storing of private information. Social media facilitates private messaging and some social media sites or apps are made specifically to delete content after a set amount of time, like Snapchat. The personal smart device and social media as an extension or part of that device are presented as safe, secure and confidential di digital spaces in which users can keep or share their secrets and note I say presented as. Syed writes of par paranormal activity that quote, by containing the paranormal activity inside the borders of a screen, the lead characters can better understand, measure and even control it, end quote. Unfriended dark web subverts this apparent control. The viewer shares in illicit activity as the first act they see the protagonist perform is trying to break into a stolen laptop by searching the original owner's social media for possible passwords. Whatever the viewer's ethical feelings might be about stealing and hacking a laptop, they're forced to go along with it. The film then repeatedly shows the characters attempting to control their quickly escalating situation using digital means, such as downloading records from the laptop or taking money from the antagonist Bitcoin account as insurance, only to find they have ultimately done exactly what the antagonist, who has a far greater digital control and power, wanted them to do. It is interesting then that such a strong part of the found, found phone trope depends upon social media surveillance particularly the searching of social media for hacking or data collection purposes. For example, finding pet names for possible passwords or to answer security questions, 
using work or social connections to contact people who might be able to provide information and tracking where someone has checked in to find out if they could have been in a specific place to perform a crime at a specific time. This is particularly common in video and AI, AR games that utilize social media. As co-creator of Unread, Shib Hussain says, quote, it's somewhere between voyeurism and curiosity about how other people's lives operate. Your phone is so personal, end quote. However, these mechanics do not always raise an ethical dilemma in the player about whether it is right or acceptable to harvest data for hacking purposes in the game context. Joe Ball, co-creator of Jiri Game, writes of ethical concerns within his game, quote, to date, we haven't had anyone express concern about looking through a stranger's social media, but we do present it as evidence within the case, so the ethics are removed by the position of power. It is also obvious that the things involved are part of solving the mystery. Possibly that means an audience forego their usual concerns, end quote. But the information gathered through social media exploration is not always utilized for purely mechanical purposes. This media often allows, invites, or encourages the player to explore more personal areas of the unlocked device. This plays on a desire in the player to experience a kind of justified or excusable voyeurism as they search for the information they need, but in the process almost certainly come across superfluous information about the device owner's private life. In Simulacra, the player is presented with two potential love interests of the phone's original owner and is at various points asked to make decisions about which, if either they trust, based on the personal information and private conversations they are able to access through the phone. In many ways, the characters are haunted by the devices themselves and the parts of their lives they might have shared with their devices, believing them to be confidential. The phone becomes a place where the characters can hide the worst parts of themselves in the private areas while sharing the best parts of themselves in public areas. The horror the characters experience comes as a result of these private confidential aspects of themselves being made public. As Unfriended demonstrates, this comes not only from whatever supernatural phenomenon may be at work in the story, but also from the public humiliation and bullying that occurs when transgressions are made public on the internet. And this is a screen grab uh, from Unfriended when this happens. The film's ghost repeatedly makes public pictures of the character's darkest secrets and shows the reams of comments such as, you're going to hell and don't ever speak to me again. However, there is another layer of meaning, as besides the supernatural haunting of the devices, the characters are also haunted by the viewer or player. The viewer or player understands that what they are experiencing is a hyper-reality, a lifelike simulation utilizing images and mechanisms that are probably deeply personal to them, containing many of their own secrets and privacies. Simulacra even references Baudrillard quite hard towards the end of the game, clearly reveling in this intersection of entertainment and theory. AR game creator Joe Ball describes the reason for inclusion of social media reproductions in their game, writing that social media, quote, are unfortunately, question mark, ingrained into the way that we understand other people. So it's an easy way to connect an audience to a character, unquote. Use of social media promotes suspension of disbelief and getting players engaged into the world. In this way, the player haunts the characters, but the media also haunts the player as they are asked to consider what might happen if their own dark secrets locked away in supposed electronic privacy made their way somehow onto a public forum. As Hamrick writes of Unfriended, quote, observing, observing the cyberbullying of dead classmate Laura developed through a cinematic reproduction of the same social media sites, Unfriended's viewer is thus made to feel as though they too are complicit in the torture of Laura Barnes, end quote. These anxieties in many respects come down to a balance of power. Surveillance theory has been examining the ways in which surveillance relates to social media and Facebook stalking, also known as social surveillance. Marwick defines social surveillance as, quote, the ongoing eavesdropping investigation, gossip and inquiry that constitutes information gathering by people about their peers. These practices are facilitated and extended by the digitization of social information normalized by social media, end quote. Marwick also notes that Web 2.0 sites such as Twitter and Facebook, quote, are designed for users to continually investigate digital traces left by the people they are connected to through social media, end quote. 
In this respect, social media aims to create a society in which all users are equal. It is expected that friends will explore and view a user's social media, and that user curates their social media accordingly, presenting the hyperreal personality they wish others to perceive. That user will in turn view and partake in their peer social media, creating a society in which everyone is both viewed and viewer. Unfriended, for example, provides, quote, a meditation upon our fear of the deterioration of privacy as accused by social media, as well as the risks posed to our overall agency as that privacy is lost, end quote. The horror in these texts in part comes from this balance of power being tipped. As Hart writes, quote, both unfriended films suggest a deep anxiety about a perceived imbalance of power in the digital realm, end quote. Several of these media involve supernatural entities who are not able, who are able to not only access the character's private digital information, but also pose as the characters disseminating it, leaving apparently no trace of the supernatural entity itself. However, perhaps the most horrific of these texts discussed is Unfriended Dark Web, which features no supernatural entity at all. The antagonists are presented as potentially supernatural through parts of the film, causing digital glitches when they appear in camera footage and possessing the ability to delete their text-based communications. However, the end of the film reveals that the antagonist is actually a group of super hackers who are able to kill each of the film's characters in turn using not supernatural influence, but digital manipulation to have them executed by police firing squad, lured to places where they can be assaulted, or controlling network smart devices, such as hospital ventilators. The final reveal that the antagonist in the film is not only human, but also supported and cheered on by hundreds of thousands of viewers, creates a deep sense of dread in the viewer as they realize how much of their life is reliant on and entrusted to smart technology, and that they have become one of these viewers. And at the end of the film, which is again, uh, almost entirely shown as a laptop screen, it zooms out to show that that screen is part of a larger screen. And part of that includes a uh, kind of a viewer ticker like you might see on YouTube that is steadily going up, showing that people are watching these poor group of people being tortured basically, and implying that the viewer is one of these people. Following on from general impressions and tropes found within the found phone subgenre, we're now going to move on to a close textual analysis of a novel that utilizes the found phone as one of its central narrative devices. Jason Arnip's novel Ghoster follows Kate, who is about to move in with her boyfriend Scott, only to discover that he has disappeared, leaving only his phone behind. Kate, who is battling recovery from social media addiction, feels she must explore the phone's contents to find out what happened to Scott. The phone is actually possessed by a demonic entity that absorbs the souls and eventually the physical bodies of its owners by playing on weaknesses it discovers through the character's interactions with the phone. The title is a play on the term ghosting or ghosted, which is defined by Lefebvre et al as, quote, unilaterally ceasing communication temporarily or permanently in an effort to withdraw access to individuals, prompting relationship dissolution, suddenly or gradually, commonly enacted via one or multiple, uh, sorry, by one or multiple technological mediums, end quote. This usage of the verb to ghost has, as of December when I completed the bulk of this research, yet to be defined in the Oxford English Dictionary, demonstrating that this usage is a very recent phenomenon. In Lefebvre et al's case study, one respondent described ghosting as, quote, not returning someone's calls and messages, end quote which could have been enacted in the analog age, but the very recent development of the usage suggests that this particularly relates to online and social media contact. The title Ghoster therefore has a dual meaning, referencing the ghosting tactic that Kate believes Scott has enacted by vanishing and cutting contact with her, while also situating the novel as a ghost story. The mobile phone is presented as central to Ghoster from its cover, which portrays a cracked mobile phone screen. It has a low battery symbol in the top right corner and Wi-Fi and signal bars in the top left. At the top of the screen is a one-sided messenger conversation that looks like it could be taken from Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp. As in the Unfriended franchise, this lean into realism sets up the reader's expectations that this story is going to feature a world and applications they recognize and that are part of their everyday lives. As Hart writes of Unfriended, quote, 
by locking its depiction of a digital ghost into a laptop screen, its ghostliness is grounded in familiar everyday technological experience, end quote. This is an example of technorealism, a device used in fiction where online media such as text messages, forum posts, or recognizable messaging apps are pictorially displayed within the text. A really good example of this is in the Slender Man novel by Anonymous, which I don't necessarily recommend on its own merits, but has some interesting stuff to do with technorealism. You can also find this quite heavily utilized in Sarah Lotz's The Three. This technique is used throughout Ghoster, particularly to show messages between Kate and her friend Izzy, but on the cover the messages are implied to be from Kate to Scott. Flanagan asserts that technorealism is, quote, used to construct a relationship between physical and digital selves, end quote. In Ghoster, this could literally be the case, as two of its characters, Kate and Scott, eventually become digital ghost versions of themselves, trapped inside the ghost phone. The use of techno-realism within the novel may seem superfluous as the actual text of its interspersed messages do little to further the story, but they encourage the reader to think of its characters as digital selves, as their selves become increasingly digital. The phone's disappeared previous owners are believed to still be alive by their friends and family because their social media accounts are still active. One of the first things Kate asks her friend Izzy to do when Scott ghosts her is to check his social media. The generic memes and retweets found there convince Kate that Scott is still alive somewhere. Although it is not made explicit, it is implied that whatever entity controls the ghost phone also creates these social media posts. The entity reveals itself to have something of a sense of humour when posting the dog in a burning house meme, which after the last year I think we're all pretty familiar with by now, alluding to the fact that Scott may actually be in hell. The gothic implications of social media outliving or outlasting its users has precedence in reality. Manchester bomber victim Martin Het was highly active on Instagram before his death. In a Guardian article, his brother describes how Martin's, quote, existence was eternally self-documented in detail across social media, and the abrupt end to this constant barrage of self-directed content means his online legacy has a stark truth about it that's more powerful than anything he could have intentionally put together, end quote. Het's social media streams still receive reposts, likes, and comments despite the lack of reply. In this respect, Het continues to live through the self-curated reflection of his life, which, while it can no longer develop, still enables friends, family and strangers to have some kind of interaction with a version of him. For me, there are clear links here between Martin Het's ongoing online legacy and the assumption of the families of Ghosters' victims' families, assuming that life continues because memes and retweets continue. Another classically gothic archetype heavily used in Ghoster is photography. Photography's gothic roots lie in the uncanny recognition that the person in the photograph is the same and yet different to its real life counterpart, as well as the language still used around photography, like a photo shoot and capturing an image. As Marina Warner writes in Phantasmagoria, quote, optical devices did not concentrate solely on extending the faculty of sight as an organ of sense, but developed concurrently as instruments of imagination, end quote. Taken in this way, photographs and the act of photographing can be seen as a portal for the imagination, for individuals to project their own ideas and anxieties onto an image. There is also a control of the photographer over the photograph subject that Christina von Braun describes, quote, the eye of the observer is always dominant. Its activity and power over reality express themselves in two ways. On the one hand, the photographic eye subsumes the other, devouring it whole in order to empower itself. The photographic eye also takes possession of the other, insofar as it brings the time the other inhabits to a standstill." End quote. The ease of photography and filming that has come about with the smartphone is ut utilized in Ghoster to express the anxieties of Arnhem's characters. The ghost phone, le phone learns about its target's weaknesses by filming them when they sleep. These films are hours long and it is implied that the phone does this entirely autonomously without a user holding or operating the phone. This is an unsettling proposition for a number of reasons. To begin with, Kate thinks that Scott has been filming previous lovers as they slept and that someone has broken into the apartment to film her sleeping. 
This recalls a popular visual utilized in some of the horror films previously discussed. A reader with knowledge of the horror genre might recall scenes in the Paranormal Activities franchise, which show footage of zombie-like individuals standing over each other for hours as their partner sleeps, as pictured. However, the act of filming while performing this odd behavior adds another layer of disturbance. Warner summarizes a number of litigations in Phantasmagoria that demonstrate a battle since photography's invention for ownership of the taken image. She writes that the eventual imposition of copyright law meant that, quote, the person's image is an intrinsic and an alienable part of personhood and cannot consequently be taken by another without consent, end quote. This might again recall the issues around intrusive journalism discussed previously and the long arguments over the ownership of people in the public eye. Yet Ghost's films are not only taken without permission, they are taken when the subject is completely exposed, when they are asleep. This is a further level of violation that removes all avenues of safety for the characters and provokes in the reader the delicious chill that many horror texts such as the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise prey on when implying that it is dangerous to fall asleep. There is a sense of hyper-reality to social media in the way that a social media self is constructed and is at the same time true and not true being both a reflection of the user and a curated self-governed reflection or image of the user. However, social media is also in many senses uncanny. It is often filled with selfie images of the user and videos of them and perhaps other known acquaintances. Like much of what is posted on social media, these are true images of the user. But at the same time, there is a self-awareness in the way a selfie is taken that makes it uncanny. There are even guides and how-tos on how to get the perfect selfie smile or how to smile naturally in selfies, such as Natural News' Six Tricks to Get the Perfect Selfie with a Smile, Cosmopolitan's How to Take a Good Selfie, and Who What Wears Nine Unusual Tips to Fake the Perfect Smile in Photos. In fact, Googling how to selfie smile produces literally hundreds of thousands of clickbait-esque options to choose from. This sense of uncanny social media continues into Ghoster, particularly in the way Tinder is used. For those not aware, Tinder is an internet dating app where users are presented with a single picture of a person and either swipe right to indicate interest in a potential match or swipe left to discard the person. There is no communication between users until this initial decision has been made. So users are forced to accept or discard potential love interests based solely on their appearance in one picture. In Ghoster, Kate and Scott first encounter each other on Tinder, and their respective pictures are a motif recalled at various points in the book. In Kate's case, Scott, Scott's picture is sometimes recalled when she perceives a wolfish expression on his face, which she associates with him perhaps not being the happy, easygoing person he appears to be. There is also a contrast between how Kate's picture is perceived by each member of the couple. Scott thinks it is the perfect picture. Quote, Kate is sticking her tongue out in a sort of mock defiance, and yet something about those eyes makes me want to wrap my arms around her and tell her everything's going to be all right. Despite the silly tongue thing, the girl has this kind of vulnerable look, and I can't get her out of my head, end quote. However, Kate thinks that her profile picture shows her, quote, crooked smile splayed across that weird mouth, her eyes that are too far apart, her short hair of no fixed stylistic abode, and her paltry cleavage, end quote. This is just one example out of many throughout Ghoster, demonstrating how easily the same image or information can be interpreted differently by different people, and how frequently this is an issue with social media and the portrayal of the self created on social media. Both Scott and Kate use the same profile picture across all of their social media accounts, increasing the impression that the social media personas of Kate and Scott are a separate but consistent entity from the real person. Retberg describes profile pictures as, quote, a visual expression of identity, and our choice of profile pictures is clearly a form of visual self-representation, end quote. Therefore, although they may not like their own profile pictures, Kate and Scott have clearly chosen the pictures as avatars of themselves to be taken as a hyper-real extension of themselves and to represent themselves to others. The repetition of phrases such as, I can't get her out of my head, reinforce the idea that not only are these online selves uncanny, they are also haunting each other. 
This brings to mind Warner's ideas on the photograph that, quote, the resemblance materializing in its uncannily fixed form in the photograph might contain some material residue of the person transmitted with the light rays from his or her body, end quote. Besides utilizing ideas of ownership, ethics, and permission in a supernatural sense, Arnup also highlights how these are very real concerns in the real world. Tyler, who is Kate's new paramedic partner, films extreme accidents and deaths which he attends in a professional capacity and uploads the films and photographs to a website called Sick Fucks. This in itself is described as an act as a kind of addiction and a play for attention. Kate summarizes the addiction by describing it as, quote, sharing sick pictures, these shots that only you can take, earns you a micro dose of power and prestige. It earns you one single gram of leverage in this world, end quote. This calls back to the dark revelation of the private or secret selves exposed in the unfriend in unfriended and anxieties about those who have more power in the social surveillance balance. Tyler uses his power heavy privileges over the viewing of others lives as a paramedic to publicly share horrific moments from those people's lives online. But Ghost goes further than merely using filming as a device to provoke paranoia in its characters and readers. The filming itself allows the phone to learn something intrinsic about its subjects and eventually to steal their souls. In Kate's case, the phone provides her with a mystery that draws her back into social media addiction, encouraging her to search through Scott's social media and private diary entries kept on his phone. For Scott, the phone supplies more and more outlandish and unprompted pornography to feed his porn addiction. This is echoed in the version of hell or purgatory the couple enter when the phone has fully absorbed them, which is described here by Kate, quote, a nice mushroom risotto sits on the table beside me as I flick through Facebook. Because I have thousands of friends, it takes a while to absorb all their news. Of course, fresh updates are popping up all the time. So this is practically a full-time job. Ha ha. We don't go out much. Actually, I can't recall the last time we set foot outside the door. But why would we ever need to? End quote. Both Kate and Scott are so absorbed in their respective addictions, they are unable to enjoy their idealized home. It is only with great effort that Kate is able to realize that the whole apartment is a construct and briefly escapes as a digital ghost entity, haunting the current owner of the ghost phone, the next person who is doomed to be absorbed. This echoes the common idea from early photography that suggested a camera stole souls, although Warner proposes this was actually an idea perpetuated by early photographers, in part to patronize their primitive or uneducated subjects. However, the idea of devices watching or listening to their users is becoming an increasing contemporary concern. With the advent of smart devices such as Amazon's Echo or OK Google, the home is progressively being filled with devices that exist to listen to householders. These softwares are also installed on most smartphones, facilitating both syncing with home devices and enabling the phones themselves to be voice activated. However, many smartphone manufacturers also enable default settings that allow smartphones to listen to their users to enable targeted advertising. As Commando writes, quote, when you use your default settings, everything you say may be recorded through your device's onboard microphone. Our phones routinely collect our voice data, store it in a distant server, and use it for marketing purposes, end quote. In Ghoster, Izzy recalls this possibility when she asks, quote, what if the phone has some kind of bugging device, babe? What if it's listening all the time? Or, I mean, you say you felt watched, end quote. These ideas of digital surveillance are further utilized when Izzy identifies some of the phone's previous owners by using Google Image Search, a service that allows users to search the World Wide Web for image content. In this case, Izzy searches for a photograph found on the phone under the correct assumption that the same image would appear on the owner's social media feed. There are also references to using Google Street View, a service which allows a user to search for an address and then see images from the street itself. And again, these appear in a really kind of uncanny way if you've not used Street View, because you can kind of move the camera around and see it in what appears to be real time. It, it's very strange. Uh, again, we are presented with the framework of social media surveillance, where the user expects to be both viewed and viewer. 
the characters show no moral compunctions about locating previous victims using their social media or images. It is to be expected. Uh, sorry, it is to be expected, just as Kate was formerly obsessed with the self she presented on social media. This layering of surveillance allows for ghosts of the self to exist, not only in social media, but in the giant servers of unknown technological giants, such as Amazon, Facebook, and Google. Traces of users' search histories, preferences, and status updates are analyzed as they are made by faith faceless algorithms, producing images of a self based on likes and dislikes to help effectively target advertising. The idea of finding a remnant of a person be that through a written document or found footage, has clearly entertained and entranced consumers of entertainment media for centuries. The found media is only made more compelling by proofs and revelations of its veracity through producing histories of the individuals or steeping the narrative in the normal day-to-day -day minutiae that would only be recorded in a true document. It should come as no surprise then that as smart technology and social media has made it easier and easier to document our lives in a way that is true and at the same time curated. Entertainment media has utilized these records to create a new found trope. However, as the content of social media has provided more convenience and apparent privacy than the regular diary or vlog, it has become a more intrinsic part of the 21st century self. The closeness a user feels to their social media accounts, the fact they have become a hyper real extension or projection of the individual, only creates more potential for horror as these other selves are corrupted or revealed. What might be more surprising is the voyeuristic joy a player or viewer takes in the viewing and even hacking of the accounts of strangers for entertainment purposes. While social surveillance has become prevalent and expected, there is a social contract that assumes the surveilled and surveyors are equal both sharing and viewing information with an assumed balance of power. It is when this power balance is disrupted, be that through fictional supernatural presences, the very real information collecting mega corporations or individuals with the skill to truly manipulate our digital lives that the true horror is revealed. Thank you very much. And I have a couple of, place of uh, pages of references here for anyone who is interested.